Efendim oturumumuz başlıyor. Lütfen yerlerinizi alınız. Efendim öndeki boş koltukları doldurabilir miyiz lütfen? Öne doğru gelebilir misiniz? Teşekkürler. Simultane çevrelere erişim Zoom mobil uygulaması üzerinden gerçekleştirilecektir. Tercüme hizmetlerimizden yararlanmak için oturumlara kişisel kulaklığınızla cep telefonunuz üzerinden ekrana yansıtılan karakodu okutarak bağlantı sağlamanız, aynı zamanda Zoom yayınını Türkçe dinleyebilmek için telefonlarınızı kulaklıkla telefonlarınıza kulaklıklarınızı takmanız önemli rica olur. Teşekkür ederiz. Bu oturum için sözü moderatörümüz İren Dicle Aykut'a bırakıyoruz. Buyurun hocam. Uh, hello, greetings. Uh, welcome to the fifth international symposium on uh, cinema and philosophy organized by the Journal of Cine Philosophy. Uh, I'm very, very honored and very pleased to introduce you uh, our next keynote speaker, who is a really important and distinguished scholar in the area of film philosophy. Uh, Richard Rushton is a professor uh, in film at Lancaster uh, University Institute for Contemporary Arts. Uh, he has published numerous uh, papers on film, uh, especially focusing on the intersection between theory, culture, and the image. In addition, uh, he is the author of uh, very important uh, books, uh, Deleuze and Bollemontes, uh, The Politics of Hollywood Cinema, Cinema After Deleuze, uh, The Reality of Film, and uh, What is Film Theory, co-written uh, co with Gary Pattinson, are his uh, books, uh, which have uh, inspired us all, these books, you know. Uh, after uh, the speech of our keynote speaker, we will have uh, a Q&A session uh, if you would like to ask any questions. Now, I'm really uh, honored to introduce you again our um, keynote speaker, Richard Rushton, uh, and he will give us his, his speech entitled Reflections on the Reality of Film. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for uh, that fantastic uh, introduction. Um, and thanks very much for this symposium. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the sessions I've attended so far, and um, uh, long may it continue. Um, thanks very much for inviting me as well. Um, you may notice that I've got a bit of a cut on my chin. I had a bicycle accident last weekend, but I'm actually all fit and well, um, if looking a little bit worse for wear. Um, but I'm, you know, perfectly uh, healthy. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I'm hoping you can all see my PowerPoint. Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, 
Okay, so my aim today is to review some arguments from a book I published in 2011 called The Reality of Film. Now, I make a number of arguments in The Reality of Film, and even today I'm not quite sure where they fit on the map of film studies. This probably has a lot to do with the language I use. I talk about the reality of film rather than the realism of films, although these two terms are certainly interlinked. So I guess what I want to do today is to clarify some of the stakes of my arguments. So how did I come to this idea, this idea of the reality of film? Well, I suppose, um, I suppose it came from a general dissatisfaction with what I thought were the common arguments in film studies. And I thought they were common <laughs> or typical back then, say 10 or 15 years ago, but I'm also not sure much has changed since then. The key factor to consider, I think, is that scholars often feel that their main objective if they are a scholar in film studies, is to establish which types of cinema are true. To do this, a scholar will then also have to point out which types of cinema are untrue. So film studies becomes a game of playing off the true against the false. True films are the ones that show us the way the world really is or the way that cinema really is while false films typically can only provide illusions, fake images of the world. Now, I do think this kind of argument is actually still very common. So I'm just going to begin with a sort of hypothetical example. So perhaps we'll read a book or an article on slow cinema. And the argument will be something along the lines of saying that slow cinema provides a truer or better mode of engagement with the world, especially when compared with the fast-paced action movies of Hollywood cinema and commercial cinema. In other words, action cinema, and more generally speaking, Hollywood narrative cinema, those kinds of films give us a false view of the world or they merely provide illusions. Perhaps we could even say that such films take us away from the world and they provide only escapism or escapes from the world. So that's the sort of bad side of the um, ledger. By contrast, on the good side, uh, we can have slow cinema. Um, so something like slow cinema offers a truer version of the world. It can put us in touch with the real. It can put us in touch with a truer version of the world. This might be the kind of argument we'll come across. Now, I don't have anything against slow cinema. Actually, I really like slow cinema. But what I'm trying to point out here is that in this kind of argument, slow cinema is being earmarked as a true mode of cinematic representation, while fast cinema or action cinema or Hollywood cinema more generally is being criticised as being a false mode of representation. So yes, just to say I'm not against slow cinema, rather what I'm against is the argument that will advocate slow cinema as a true cinema against other kinds of cinema which are deemed false. And I'll come back to this uh, idea of slow cinema. Okay, so I'd like to think that this true versus false dichotomy or good cinema versus bad cinema dichotomy is probably pretty familiar to you. Probably the most common model of this dichotomy is provided by modernist arguments, arguments that in film studies became known as those of political modernism, uh, especially after Sylvia Harvey's book on May 68 and film theory, and of course, uh, Deanne Roderick's book on the crisis of political modernism. <clears throat> 
the argument here is more or less that modes of filmmaking which adopt modernist techniques are superior to the kinds of films that use classical conventions. That is, the kinds of films usually associated with the classical Hollywood cinema and its conventions. Now, Roderick's book lays out these arguments, you know, in a tremendous fashion, but he also tries to pose the ways in which scholars might get beyond those arguments. And Roderick's many books and articles since then have continued that kind of work in brilliant ways. Nevertheless, I think political modernism is still with us in various ways. And I think the most famous iteration of this notion of political modernism comes from Peter Wolland's remarkable article on Goddard and Counter Cinema, first published in 1972. Now, I refer to this article in the reality of film, but for some strange reason, I only list these oppositions uh, in the footnotes right near the end of the book. I was kind of struck when um, writing this piece that I hadn't uh, made more of uh, Wallen's uh, distinctions in, in the main body of my text. But nevertheless, I publish or I, I sort of copy out the table that Wallen uh, famously published uh, in this article that was first published in 1972. And we can see here on the left side of the table, Wallen has the bad or false aspects of cinema, those aspects mainly associated with classical Hollywood cinema. So this classical cinema tells clear, linear stories. It features characters with whom spectators are encouraged to identify. Um, it uses techniques of transparency, such as shot, reverse shot, the 180 degree rule, and so on, to ensure that spectators will feel as though they are looking through a window onto a view of some sort of real, supposedly real world. Uh, such films will have closed endings. Uh, they'll typically have happy endings if they're Hollywood films. Such films also give us pleasure, which is an interesting point of Wallen's uh, list. So pleasure at the cinema is deemed a, a negative or bad thing uh, by Wallen on this list. And finally, the kinds of worlds produced by these kinds of films are deemed fictional. That's the last point on the list there. So the classical cinema takes us away from the real and the true. By contrast, on the right-hand side of the, um, the table, um, we have techniques that a true or real cinema will possess according to this sort of division that Wallen makes. So here we'll have ambiguous narratives. Uh, we will have characters and stories that encourage estrangement or alienation. And uh, the influence of Brecht is uh, uh, key here. So we'll be alienated or estranged from characters rather than identifying with them. We'll have techniques that block transparency instead, uh, which constantly remind us that we are watching a film, the so-called foregrounding of the cinema apparatus. We'll have open endings rather than closed endings. Uh, we'll have a spectator who works and thinks rather than a spectator who uh, enjoys or takes pleasure in the cinema. And finally, the last point on the list there, these kinds of films, a counter cinema, will give us uh, access to reality rather than give us fictionality. So Wolin's oppositions give us a really clear insight into uh, this notion of political modernism uh, embodied here in Wolin's conception of counter cinema. And I think these categories and designations have been incredibly influential. The result is that a good or true or real cinema, a counter cinema, is placed against a false cinema, a fictional cinema that shows us fictions and illusions rather than realities. <laughs>
So there's the sorts of divisions. Hollywood or mainstream cinema is deemed false and a counter cinema is necessary in order to install truth. Now, just in case you think these kinds of arguments aren't still relevant, well, I'll point to these couple of examples of slow cinema from fairly recent um, journal publications. So one publication by Tiago De Luca that was published in Cinema Journal in 2016, and another by Angelos Koutsarakis that was published in Screen in 2019. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but I'll just say that in general terms, both of these authors rely on the kinds of distinctions that Wolin, you know, first laid out in uh, that article on counter cinema in 1972. Now, De Luca and Kutsarakis don't do this openly. They don't refer to Wolin's article or necessarily straightforwardly to his categories. Rather, it's though it's as though these categories and this opposition between a true and a false cinema are kind of so generalised and common in film studies that these scholars use them more or less unconsciously. It's as though these categories are almost a kind of unconscious of film studies. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detailed readings of either of those uh, articles, so you'll just have to take my word for it. My simple point is that these categories, um, the categories so clearly spelled out by Peter Wolin 50 years ago, these categories still seem to be as persistent as ever today. And I find this fairly problematic. I'm tempted to say that to some degree, nothing much has changed in film studies in 50 years. And I made this sort of similar point in my book on the reality of film. Of course, I'm overemphasizing here, uh, certainly a lot has changed in film studies in 50 years. But at the same time, I find it pretty extraordinary that these same categories, Wolin's deadly sins and cardinal virtues, as he calls them, are still pretty prominent in film studies. Okay, so I've spent a fair amount of time outlining this opposition between bad and good cinema or between false and true cinema. And I've done this because I think it's a fairly reductive and rather too simplistic opposition or set of oppositions. So if I think there are problems with these oppositions, then what are the alternatives? Well, in my book on the reality of film, I try to outline some of the ways of getting beyond this bad versus good dichotomy uh, by way of André Bazin, Christian Metz, Stanley Cavell, and then by way of Gilles Deleuze. And in fact, I had hoped I would have time to say a little bit about Deleuze today, especially in relation to Federico Fellini's 1983 film, And the Ship Sails On. But unfortunately, I won't have time to do that today. Um, I sort of emphasise the unfortunately, because there would have been some nice crossovers with David Martin Jones's paper from earlier. But I've decided to... Uh, pursue a slightly different direction today. Um, when I look back at the theorists I use in the reality of film, I have to admit that my approach is very white, is definitely male and is definitely Eurocentric. So I'll admit that there are real problems of diversity in the authors that I, I privilege. But I'll also sort of defend myself by saying that I have to start somewhere. Um, so if I can take positives and negatives from those writers I've focused on, then they can always be expanded into other domains. And I'm very keen to do such things. Um, but I have to admit, certainly for the present, that these debates are very much centered on the European tradition. <clears throat> 
So other chapters in my book on the reality of film, there's a chapter on Slavoj Žižek. And finally, there's a chapter on Jacques Ranciere, and it's about Ranciere that I want to speak today. Now, I want to do this in a reasonably straightforward fashion, because I have to admit that it's very easy to get tied up in knots when thinking about Ranciere. His way of thinking about cinema and about art more generally simply doesn't fit into the ways most of us have been taught to think about these fields. In short, Ranciere approaches things differently, and I suppose that's actually why I'm very attracted to his arguments. Okay, so I hope many of you will know that Ranciere proposes some broad philosophical categories in his accounts of aesthetics. He proposes a distinction between what he calls the representative regime of art, and broadly speaking, this relates to the types of art produced in the West up until the beginning of the 19th century, more or less. Then after this, beginning sometime in the late 18th century and 19th centuries, there emerges a new conception of what art is. And Ranciere refers to this as the aesthetic regime of art. Now, on the surface, this might seem to be a distinction between classical and modern art. So the representative regime might seem like it's merely another name for classical art. Noting that Ranciere is talking about the fine arts of painting and sculpture, but also literature, poetry and theatre. So the representative regime might just seem like another name for classical art, whereas the aesthetic regime could just be another name for modern art and its methods. So a simple response to Ranciere's categories would be to fit them in with existing categories. So I could be just jumping ahead a little bit in my argument here, but we could see these categories being very easily fitted on top of Wallen's distinctions, those political modernist distinctions. So the classical art classical art, the representative regime of art might be the bad, <laughs> on the bad side of the ledger, whereas the aesthetic regime of art might be on the good side of the le ledger. This would be a way of actually fitting in Ranciere's categories to debates on modernism and political modernism more generally. Now, not to complicate things too much, but actually, to some degree, this is correct. <laughs> but it's correct only to a small and specific degree. Ranciere certainly thinks the debates and issues that emerge with the aesthetic regime of art are radically different from those of the representative regime. For example, works of art of the aesthetic regime are more democratic, and Ranciere thinks this is a very good thing. But to simply reduce Ranciere's distinction between these two image regimes to a distinction between bad classical art or a bad representative regime on the one hand, and good modern art or a good aesthetic regime on the other, would be to miss Ranciere's point. Okay, so if we don't have a distinction between bad and good, then what is Ranciere's point? Well, across a range of writings, uh, and on the slide here, I offer a range of English translations of some of those works. Across a range of writings, Ranciere tries to refine his account of aesthetics. I'm going to try to strip those accounts back to some major themes. So let's try to look at things in the following way. For the representative regime, practices of art, literature and theatre follow pre-given rules 
art follows rules. You know, this is a guiding principle of the representative regime. Of course, those rules will change over time and they will be different in different places, but they will be rules. And the task of art in the representative regime will be to follow those rules that are handed down from one generation to the next. The second point is that for the representative regime, art will be separate from everyday life. What Ranciere means by this is that art is what is hung in the mansions and palaces of the rich and powerful, or it's what's performed in grand houses for illustrious people, if we're thinking about theatre or music. And as for novels and poetry, well, only the well-off educated classes can read such things anyway. So art is made for the rich and powerful, as it were. And to that degree, it's separated from the everyday world of the average person, certainly separate from uh, the world of the poor. So for this regime, the representative regime, Art, literature and theatre are, generally speaking, not things that poor or ordinary people can engage with. Art is something that is made for the rich and powerful and does not concern itself with the everyday lives of the poorer classes. So Ranciere argues that all of this changes uh, during the 19th century, more or less with this notion of the aesthetic regime. So first of all, with the aesthetic regime, the notion that art must obey rules is no longer essential. Rather, the rules of how to make art are radically redrawn. Indeed, that's more or less what Ranciere means by aesthetic regime. It's the regime where aesthetics as such and the question what is art becomes essential. And for the aesthetic regime, the question, what is art, is an ongoing one, and it's one that has no clear answer. In short, it means that there are no rules for art. So that's the first point there. The second point, well, aesthetic also means that which pertains to the senses. And this brings us to the, the second point there. Art no longer follows rules handed down to it. So instead, it starts to take its inspiration from everyday life. That is, it takes its inspiration from the everyday lives of everyday people, drawing on the inspiration of, drawing on the evidence of the senses. So that's the aesthetic realm, the evidence of the senses. What this then means is that realism becomes central to the aesthetic project of the 19th century. And this is the case for painting, literature and for theatre. It's also the reason why art and everyday life come to be intertwined. Certainly these points are central for Ranciere's arguments. Okay, so I think this is all sort of reasonably complicated so far, but things do tend to come, uh, do tend to become slightly more complicated. I'm going to try to make things as clear as I possibly can. Oh, sorry, this is just a sort of follow on point from before. Art now relies on the evidence of the senses. Uh, under the conditions of the aesthetic regime of art, and realism becomes central to the aesthetic project. So let's think about a key question. What does realism introduce to art? Well, mostly for Ranciere, it introduces the fact that art is no longer a matter just for the rich and powerful, rather anyone and anything can be subjects of art. 
Now, it turns out that Rancière's strongest articulations of the importance of realism, certainly in the 19th century, occur in relation to literature, especially the writings of Gustave Flaubert, and especially Flaubert's novel, Madame Bovary, first published in 1857. Okay, so I know I'm speaking about literature here, but the arguments Rancière makes are ones that he'll then go on to make for cinema and film more generally. So I'd ask you to bear with me. Okay, so what's important about realism in art? and also what's important about realism in literature and in Madame Bovary. Well, first of all, here in Madame Bovary um, and in realism more generally, realism relies on the meticulous description of the real based on the evidence of the senses. Secondly, Ranciere argues convincingly that many of Flaubert's contemporaries were put off by Flaubert's overly detailed descriptions. These critics were critical of Flaubert's descriptions because those descriptions didn't properly suit the stories that were being told. The descriptions were too much. In other words, they were excessive and they were useless in the sense that they did not help the story that was being told. In fact, they got in the way of the story. And so contemporary critics, certainly some contemporary critics of Flaubert were critical of Madame Bovary on these grounds. But what all of this means is that Realist description was a way of overturning the existing rules of art. So if the representative regime expected stories that were of a particular kind, that were told in a particular way, especially stories about the rich and powerful, then realist description was the key way in which those rules of storytelling were dismantled. The older kinds of stories were no longer going to be told. Rather, the new realism would find new stories to tell, and those stories would not be based on the rules of storytelling that had been passed down from the prior generations. Rather, they would be stories that would grow out of realist description. They would grow out of the evidence of the senses. They would grow out of the experiences of everyday life. So that's the first couple of things to bear in mind about the importance of the emergence of realism in the 19th century. And then for Rancière, there's another step. This realism can then go in two directions, or it does go in two directions. Um, one direction goes to what we can probably call high modernism. In this direction, realist description becomes more and more abstract until any sense of story or representation becomes absorbed entirely by description itself. To some extent, this all happens in literature for some of uh, Ranciere's favoured examples, uh, Proust, Mallarmé, Virginia Woolf and others. But it seems to me the clearest examples are actually in painting. Uh, so in the 19th century, French painting goes from realism in Courbet through to Impressionism, then to Cezanne's more and more abstract canvases, with all of this being based on the evidence of the senses, until we eventually get to the abstractions of the early 20th century with Cubism in uh, Picasso and Braque, and the other abstractions of high modernism, such as suprematism or the works of Mondrian, probably all the way up to abstract expressionism in the US and beyond. 
So Rancière's argument is basically to say all of those abstractions actually start with realism in the 19th century, but it goes in a direction of description that becomes more and more descriptive to the point where all uh, story is peeled away and you just have a kind of pure description. Uh, so descriptive, in fact, that it becomes abstract. Now, the point to argue here, uh, as Rancière does, is that one path from realism leads to abstraction, and in doing so, it leads art away from everyday life. Rancière actually argues that this is a tendency that Flaubert himself seems to follow. Um, Rancière argues that Flaubert's experimental novels, especially The Temptation of St. Anthony and Salambo, are novels in which the detailed encrustations of description overwhelm any sense of story. To a certain extent in these novels, story disappears and abstraction becomes paramount. Okay, so that's one path. Realism leads to abstractions in which eventually all story more or less disappears. This is one path away from the rules of art that held sway during the representative regime. And it's one of the con consequences of realism in the 19th century. There is another path. This other path is one in which art and real life become ever more intertwined. That is where everyday objects become works of art or where works of art become everyday objects. Now, this tendency, argues Rancière, is actually the path followed by Emma Bovary, the central character of Flaubert's novel. Emma Bovary wants to buy things and she likes to buy things. Perhaps we can call these things that she buys commodities. But she wants to buy these things because she wants her everyday life to be filled with beautiful objects. All of this means that this direction takes us fairly and squarely in the direction of democracy. Certainly, this is Rancière's argument. These are democratic acts. Art no longer belongs just in the mansions and palaces of the rich and powerful. Rather, art can be available to everyone. And Emma Bovary does not want art that abstracts from everyday life. Rather, she wants her art and her life to be intertwined. And even more than this, Rancière argues that what Emma Bovary really wants is for this conjunction between art and life to add up to something. From all of these objects, objects that thrill Emma Bovary's senses in the same way that her clandestine sexual liaisons thrill her, she wants all of these objects and experiences of the senses to add up to something. Now, what do I mean by saying that Emma Bovary wants her experiences to add up to something? Well, in short, argues Rancière, she wants to make her life into a story. And this really ends up being the key point here. Emma Bovary does not want her sensual pleasures to dissolve stories. She doesn't want those sensual pleasures to go in the direction of abstraction. Rather, she wants them to be available to her everyday life. She wants those sensual experiences to create new stories, those stories that will give meaning to her everyday life. So if the path from realism to abstraction is one in which story disappears, then for this other direction out of realism, 
uh, this direction that I'm sort of trying to trace here by way of the fictional character of Emma Bovary. Realism means a world in which the evidence of the senses and the intersection between art and life will add up to something. They will add up to a story or a history. Okay, so these are the two paths that lead out of realism, one in which abstraction triumphs and story disappears, and another where the intertwining between art and life leads to new stories. These are stories that are not defined by the old rules of the representative regime, but are instead stories that are built from the ground up, as it were, from the evidence of the senses, from the experiences of everyday life. Rancière puts this in evocative ways. Um, Okay, so this is the sense of a new type of storytelling that realism gives uh, rise to. Rancière puts this in evocative ways. Um, in writing about Flaubert's short story, uh, A Simple Heart, and there's a long and complicated argument coming out of this, but he makes more or less the same arguments for Madame Bovary as well. He writes that all of the realist detail described here is not there to attest that the real really is real. That's not what it's for. Rather, it is about the texture of this real. It is about the texture of this real, Rancière repeats. That is to say, the type of life that the characters live the type of life that the characters live. And I think this is the crucial point for Rancière. It's about giving voice to these everyday lives. Now, out of all this, Rancière's ever so slightly tongue-in-cheek conclusion is to declare that this is why Flaubert had to kill Emma Bovary at the end of his novel. Her commitment to joining art and life could have no place in Flaubert's own project. Flaubert's own project was to lead in the other direction, in the direction towards abstraction, whereas his character's direction was one of the intertwining of art and life. Uh, so Flaubert himself contains these two directions within his work. Okay, now back to film, finally. Now, the importance of this framework for Rancière's approach to films and cinema is crucial. Cinema is pulled between two tendencies, one that relies on the ways in which the cinema camera can, prevent, uh, can present to us the evidence of the senses. So on the right hand side of the slide there, the realist description, the evidence of the senses. And this is the tendency that properly makes the cinema part of the aesthetic regime of art. But the other tendency that exists in cinema is the art of telling stories. It seems that this latter is something which steals from the representative regime of art, this art of telling stories. So cinema is caught between the two regimes of art. It's halfway between the representative regime that tells stories and follows rules and the aesthetic regime, which has no rules and which relies on the evidence of the senses. And yes, this is true, but it's only partly true. What the cinema does is it kind of gets these things back to front or does them inside out. At any rate, this is the point that I really want to get from Rancière. Yes, cinema relies on a realism that is based on the evidence of the senses, but it also relies on a sense of stories. But it relies on a sense of story 
that is different from the kinds of stories defined by the representative regime of art. The task of the new art of cinema, born at the end of the 19th century, was to find new stories to tell, to find new textures of the real, as Rancière puts it in relation to Flaubert's realism. Now, to try to point out how this works in cinema, I just want to highlight some points Rancière makes in his short work. Um, sorry, I'll flip to this next slide. I just want to highlight um, some points Rancière makes in his short work on Bellatar called The Time After, first published in 2011. Early in the book, Rancière points to what realism is, and he writes, the essence of realism is the distance taken with regard to stories. So we get a distinction between realism and stories. Rancière opposes situations that endure to stories that link together. But then very shortly after this, he qualifies the relation between realism and story. He writes stories, and actually Rancière here means the old stories, the kinds of stories that pertain to the representative regime. Stories demand that we retain from each situation the elements capable of being inserted into a schema of causes and effects. End quote. <laughs> but this changes, I want to argue, for the new kind of story that film can provide. And here's the key sort of passage from Rancière. He states that realism, for its part, requires us to go ever deeper into the interior of the situation itself, to expand even farther back the chain of sensations, perceptions, and emotions which make human animals into beings to whom stories happen. What Rancière means is that film gives us a different kind of story, not one that's necessarily handed down that we can put into relations of cause and effect, but rather a, a, a storytelling of the interior of situations of chains of sensations and perceptions. So I think this is a different kind of story from the kind of story that exists in the representative regime. What it means is that there are no rules to the kinds of stories that can be told in the cinema. Rather, those stories are the kinds of stories that cinema and film have the capacity to tell. In another context, Context, Rancière will write, the real must be fictionalized in order to be thought. And I think that's a kind of key statement. The real must be fictionalized in order to be thought. Professor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but last five minutes, please. Yeah, Thank I've you. got about two minutes, I think. Okay, I know this is all a bit swift, but that's where I want to end up. One of the realities of film is that it has the capacity to tell stories in ways that have not been told before. From one perspective, therefore, Rancière opposes the notion that cinema's dedication to the evidence of the senses would see it separated from the task of telling stories. I just want to emphasise that a lot of these points have been made uh, before by J.M. Bernstein in an article or chapter on Rancière that I really like, Movies as the Great Democratic Art Form. So I'd highly recommend um, that chapter. But where I want to end up is just by saying that ultimately Rancière's categories do not operate on the basis of a good versus bad distinction. Rather, what's important is a sense of the possibilities and mixtures between one tendency and the other. Um, so where does this leave political modernism in relation to Rancière's arguments? Well, more than anything, the kinds of arguments proposed by political modernism 
And I've tried to argue that such arguments are still quite uh, prevalent in film studies, is that it gives us something like a return to the representative regime. That is, it provides a specific set of rules as to how films are supposed to be made and what kinds of techniques are supposed to be used. And I think this is precisely the sorts of rules that Ranciere is trying to get away from. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your very interesting speech and mind-broadening discussion on the reality of film. Uh, it was really interesting uh, and uh, very warning uh, us against uh, engaging uh, uh, deceptive uh, distinctions between good cinema or bad cinema, uh, post reality, true reality, etc. Instead of this, you inspired us to uh, accept different types of films, uh, different types of filmic expressions can produce. Uh, different realities of one sort. Uh, thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Now, I, I think we can have one or two questions from our uh, audiences, if there is. Can, can I just ask if I'm still sharing my screen? Because I, I can't work <laughs> out. To, to uh, it. it would be better to see you uh, instead of ah. the slide. Yeah, is that okay. better? Is that better now? Uh, it is better, yes. It's better, okay. I guess. Thank you very much. Yes, great, thank you. Uh, we have one question for you right now from the audience. Hello, Professor Rushton. I have a question about documentaries actually. Uh, we have recently witnessed a great improvement in performative documentary films in which a new reality is produced uh, through subjective ex experiences. It feels like these, type of, uh, these types of documentaries constitute a kind of bridge between reality and fiction. It seems like they blur the line between reality and fiction, even. How do you evaluate this blurred line? Do you think documentaries possess an ethical responsibility towards reality in a, is an archaic way of thinking in this era that we live in. Uh, thanks very much for the question. I think this is a really important question and it uh, links up with uh, some of the other uh, points that have been made in the symposium so far. Um, I think I have a 